So I actually prefer to use one light, especially if it's such a small object like that. The reason is because if you're wanting it to look natural, a window is really only one light source. And the shadows all come from one direction. So I don't mind shadows. If you want like a more soft and ethereal look, then you'll want softer shadows. But you need the shadows in order to show texture, especially if you're doing light color blooms. Otherwise, it's just going to look like one blush blob or yeah, yeah especially or white flowers, one white blob, right? So you need it at uh, one white ball. <laughs> uh, but you need the shadows to be able to show the texture of the crepe paper or the texture of the petals. Welcome to season two of the Paper Talk podcast, where we have candid conversations with artists and industry leaders from around the world. Our goal is to share knowledge, connect our community, and elevate the artistry of our craft. Hi, I'm Jesse Chu. Hello, I am Quinn Wynn, and we are the founders of the Paper Florist Collective. Hello, welcome to another episode of Paper Talk. We all know that bad photography can dissuade a customer from buying your product. On the other hand, good photography can really entice customers to learn more about your product and click on buy. So what exactly is good photography when it comes to showcasing your product or your paper flower products? Today, we have Caroline Tran of Caroline Tran Photography to give us some tips on how to create images that sell. Hello, Caroline. How Welcome are you? Back. <laughs> <laughs> Good to be back. Love you gals. Love what you guys are doing. Oh, and thanks. It's, yeah, it's, we're so, so excited to have you. Yeah, excited to help the community. So just a little bit about Caroline. She is a wedding and lifestyle portrait photographer, and she's based out in Los Angeles, but travels all over the world to shoot clients. And her work has appeared in numerous prints and online publications. You've probably seen a lot of her images on her Instagram, on publications and blogs. She's also known for creating imagery that sells stories. So So she's actually really the perfect person for us to talk to. And recently she started offering online educational courses on photography. So we're going to talk a little bit about that too, because I think it's going to be super helpful to all of us and to our listeners. So yeah, Caroline, a lot of us want to sell our paper flowers and we want to showcase them in the best light possible. And I say this metaphorically and literally. Um, (laughs) Can you give us some tips on what you consider, what what to do? A little background, like for those who didn't attend the Paper Flores Collective event, um, I shared a little bit about it there. But back in the day before I was a photographer, I was very in a similar situation as you guys, which was I was trying to sell my own craft online. Instead of paper craft, I was sewing and trying to sell my things, dresses that I sewed, whether it was for human size or doll size. <laughs> you know, tiny, you guys, so tiny. <laughs> yeah. But what it came down to is I did a lot of market research back in the day, and I was just astonished by why were some of these people able to sell their handmade outfits for $800, and yet some were only able to get $5 for it. And I'm sure a lot of you have been through that or are going through that right now, where you see some stores that are selling similar products for like 10 times the amount that you're able to get. And you're wondering why you're not getting any traction. So I did a lot of just research on, you know, what did the companies who were selling a lot of money had in common and what were the ones who were not selling and what it came down to a huge portion of it was branding and what people thought perceived value was. And so the only way you're able to communicate that nowadays is online, right? Because it's Mm -hmm. not like we, I mean, especially with the current state, it's not like there's many storefront opportunities or farmer's market or, you know, any kind of (laughs) stuff nowadays. It's entirely online. Yeah. The only way that they know what you are or who you, what you do is based on the photos and videos that you put out there. Mm -hmm. And the the way you present your stuff is going to make the difference between whether someone's willing to pay $80 for it or $8 for it. If you photograph it in really beautiful light and styled to look like it belongs in like some really nice house and people think, oh, that's what I want mine to look like, then they're going to want to buy that versus if you shot it in like yellow lighting and it's like dark in some (laughs) old bathroom and they're thinking, perfect for Halloween, you guys. (laughs) (laughs) So a couple tips for you. The number one tip is lighting. Like good light is going to make a difference. It's going to make all the difference, you know? If you are not very, if you are very new to lighting and very new to photography, then I recommend shooting it during the daytime by a window. That's the 
easiest thing you can do. Get really up close to the window. And if you have like a white board or a white sheet, put that, like basically you want to sandwich your product in between a window and a white sheet or a white board, like fo white foam core board or something like that. Then you've created like a little soft box. Make sure that the window does not have sun actually coming in. When, so that's the number one thing. The second thing I would recommend is you need color accuracy, right? For your product. Mm -hmm. You don't want someone buying your flower thinking that it's blush and then it arrives and it's actually orange. Or <laughs> yeah. 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 So you need the color to be properly represented. The best way to do that is again, one, using natural light. And this is like just for beginners, you know, if you're no experience at all yet, just stick with window, natural window light and have something white in, in it. That way your camera can recognize what's white. Otherwise, if it's entirely all color, like, and especially if it's like orange on blush, your camera might think blush is actually white and then we'll adjust the orange too. And then it's just off. So white backgrounds are very safe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it also gives your viewers a reference point so mm -hmm. they can say, oh, I see. So it's this shade of pink compared to the white. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then the other tip I would have is like dial it, dial it to look like what your ideal clients would typically want or mm -hmm. look like have. So if you want to be totally safe, do it in all white because all white just looks like e-commerce, you know, plain mm -hmm. simple. You put yeah. the imagination at work. Mm -hmm. If you want to take it a step higher, then you will now style this. Put the flowers in real life situation because people can't imagine. They need your help to show them how they can use your products. Mm -hmm. If you are only putting it in a plain white background, while that is a good start, that will only appeal to people who are specifically looking for I need a paper pink peony, mm -hmm. you know, that that's the type of client that's going to buy your product because, oh, okay, that looks like a good pink peony. Yeah. Now, if you're on Instagram on your website and you are and somebody happens to stumble upon you who isn't necessarily looking for paper flowers, you need to educate them mm -hmm. on what they're looking for. So mm -hmm. if, they, if you don't show it to them, they're going to be like, oh, that's a pretty paper. Oh, that's a pretty flower. Oh, wow, that's paper. That's cool. OK, but I'm, I don't know what I need that for. And they <laughs> exactly. Move on, right? yeah, yeah, let's move on. <laughs> yeah. So the next step you would want to do is get lifestyle shots of it. Put it in a vase. How do you envision your clients using your product? Are they going to be using it in lieu of real flowers? If so, then do floral arrangements with your paper flower and put it in a vase and put it in a, on a beautiful shelf, on a beautiful table, in the bathroom, in the kitchen, right? Show them what they can do with your flowers. If you envisioned your blooms being mixed in with fresh flowers, so maybe let's say that they have fresh greenery and they just want to add, the because greenery tends to last longer than the blooms themselves, so maybe they want fresh greenery, but have the paper blooms mixed in, mm -hmm. then maybe you're going to show that just to give them ideas and they can think, oh, okay. So, you know, instead of buying fresh blooms that keep that wilt after a week, like I will buy these paper blooms and then use the greenery and maybe even the greenery is actually potted. And <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, just tell them, don't water the paper flowers. <laughs> no water needed. <laughs> <For life. laughs> yeah, this actually does not want water and does not <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so those are, I think, some of like the quickest tips that you can do to start selling your products. You know, maybe you want it framed. Be creative. Maybe your paper, your paper blooms, make them think outside the box. It's not only for a vase. Maybe mm -hmm. it's for an arrangement on the wall, right? Mm -hmm. Then show that to them. Show them how they can decorate a nursery wall with it. Mm -hmm. Or show them how they can actually frame it right? Like a blank frame and you have some blooms in there and now you have some cool wall art with yeah. it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so Even the bowl would be really cute to hang down so the child can look at it. Yeah. 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 So tons of options to show them, but they're not going to know this unless you show it to them. It's all about education. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Exactly. And then once you have that, then photograph it. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. And what, for example, let's say they're doing at a nursery, well, the room is kind of dark. 
because, you know, babies like darker rooms. How would you go about bringing that natural light or can you bring artificial light? Do you have any recommendation for bringing artificial light in? Yeah. So the easiest way to do it would be, I do have a course about flash, by the way, that gets into detail for those. So I'm just trying to simplify, like just real basic, but there are a lot of video lights or like handheld lights that you can use that I know Profoto makes one that's actually a a strobe, a flash as well that connects to your phone. And so if you're doing iPhone photography, you can use that. There's LED panels of light. There's Those are so cool. Yeah, a whole variety of them that you can use. But if you use a video light, which is a light that stays on the whole time, that's going to be the easiest type of light to use versus a flash. A flash takes a little bit more practice because you can't see it. So you Mm -hmm. have to understand where the light is. But if you turn on like a big light bulb, for example, then that is you can actually see how the light falls on your flowers. Now, if you're going to use an artificial light, some tips I have. One is make sure it's daylight balance. Don't you? What does that mean? So you want it to be. Each light has a rating of how warm or cool it is. So you don't want fluorescent light. You don't want tungsten lights. Fluorescent light's going to be really cool. Uh, Fluorescent uh, tungsten light's going to be really yellow. Mm -hmm. So you want daylight because that light was created to be as close to sunlight as possible. The other thing you're going to want is you want it to be as big as possible. So instead of using that light to shine directly on your flowers, you want to either shoot it through curtains or bounce it off of like a white panel. I have a ton of free videos that I've done on this that you can, that you can pull. But I would say the first step is practice with the window light first, because that's what teaches you what to look for. Mm -hmm. Then once you start introducing the artificial light, what you're essentially doing is using the window light or using the artificial light to emulate window light. You're trying mm-hmm. to recreate that window using a fake or uh, artificial light. It's still real light. So I don't want to say fake light. <laughs> <laughs> fake light. Yeah. Yeah. I would say that's how both Jesse and I progressed. We definitely shot by natural light by the window. Still but then, do. Uh, I yeah, still we, do. I still do too. But there's certain situations, like for example, when Jesse was doing her book, she brought in artificial light because she had a baby. Mm -hmm. And it was like, she couldn't do it during the daytime when the kids were awake. And so she would shoot in the middle of the night. Yeah. Yeah. And I actually found the light box. So this is what I did. Mm -hmm. Amateur Mm -hmm. style. (laughs) Um, I I chose a corner in my Mm -hmm. studio that had no light at the top. Mm -hmm. And I put in two light uh, light boxes. Is that what Mm -hmm. they're called? Yeah. um, Beside me where I shot. And I had one that shot up to the ceiling so that the the light would bounce from the ceiling down. Mm-hmm. And then the other one, I would do something similar. So they kind of crossed a bit, mm-hmm. but my camera was at the top. I was using a C-mount, is that what it's called? Mm-hmm. Or C, the stand that where you can like mount yeah. your camera to look down. So I was yeah. kind of doing a flat lay all the time. So okay. I had a flat lay. That's where I did my tutorials and my images. And then I had like the light kind of bouncing off. And it kind of... I think I struggled a little bit with shadows. I wanted to ask you about that because like when, <laughs> when Quinn was like, what if you're in a dark room and you use artificial light? The first thing I thought of was shadows. Like mm-hmm. how do you prevent the harsh yeah. shadows? Because it's even harsh. if you have multiple lights, like right. somehow sometimes the shadows are just so harsh mm-hmm. that you take a photo and you're like, oh, all I see is like I, shadows. So I actually prefer to use one light, especially if it's such a small object like that. The reason is because if you're wanting it to look natural, a window is really only one light source Mm -hmm. and the shadows all come from one direction. So I don't Mm -hmm. mind shadows. If you want like a more soft and ethereal look, then you'll want softer shadows, but you need the shadows in order to show texture. Yes. Especially if you're doing light color blooms, otherwise it's Mm -hmm. just going to look like one blush blob yeah yeah especially it's white flowers, one white yeah. blob right uh-huh. so you need it at uh, one white ball <laughs> uh, <laughs> but you need the shadows to be able to show the texture of the crepe paper or the texture of the petals so what i do is you want the light source as close as possible to your flower so that's why i was saying if you're using a window you'll want to push it right up against the window And on the other side, you want that white sheet, white foam core board or white. I've used like just white cardboard as well. Pushed as close to the flower as possible, because what that does is it bounces light back. Mm -hmm. So you're going to have light coming from the window coming in and it creates a shadow. Right. 
But when you push the whiteboard on the opposite side of it, it's bouncing light back and it fills in the shadow gently. Mm-hmm. You still have shadow, but it's not yeah. so harsh. Yeah. If you're going to use artificial light, do the same thing. You're going to have the artificial light coming from one side and you're going to have another white board sandwiching it from the other. Mm-hmm. Now, if you have light coming from multiple sides, it just doesn't look natural because window doesn't typically come from multiple sides like that. I like the shadows mm-hmm. coming from one direction. Mm-hmm. So if you're going to do that, what I think, if you're having a bounce off the ceiling, the, it might just be too far away from your flower. So mm-hmm. you could either put like a white board right above. Closer, you also, yes. Yeah, you could also buy a, a light box, a right. soft box where it's, what it looks like is like a, white transparent box mm-hmm. it fills all around it's perfect for small products like that and then it has mm-hmm. a hole where you can mm-hmm. shoot through it so mm-hmm. then you can have your light shining from one side mm-hmm. and again i don't like if you're going to use artificial light i don't mm-hmm. typically like shining the light directly at it because then it mm-hmm. looks really harsh yeah yeah you could have it bouncing off of something and if you want to get like a little umbrella like a little umbrella soft it soft box Mm-hmm. Or the poor man way to do it that I always do is I love you're going to find so many uses for white foam core or white. Yeah. White sheets, white board, paper towels, as you <laughs> see. <laughs> you use white, that. <laughs> yeah, white tablecloth. So you have the light bounce off of that instead. So what you can do is if you put your soft box next to a wall, but with a little gap and you have the flash or whatever light you're using bounce off of the white wall instead, because mm-hmm. that white wall is going to look like a window now. Right. And it's going to bounce the light back like the way a window does. If you do it that way, in theory, you probably don't even need the soft box. Like if you don't have a soft box, for example, mm-hmm. you can have the flash or the light bouncing towards the wall and then you have your product next to the wall. Right. So if you look from the wall, it's going to be wall flash products mm-hmm. and then another white reflector. So white right. board, white something, bouncing it back in. This is why I wish it was video and I can show. Yeah. <laughs> I can envision it. Yeah. But I like how you're stressing. It's like the fused light. Mm-hmm. Because like you said, I think shadows are important. And especially for paper flowers, because we don't have the luminosity like real flowers where like the light can like go through the petals and you can mm-hmm. create that dimension. We actually have to like shoot it in a way that shows the dimension. So like you said, yeah, I, I think shadows are important, but just controlled shadows. I don't know. Like That's softer different. shadows. Softer yes. shadows. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then let's talk about iPhone versus a DSLR. iPhone has come such a long way and they do a really good job. You obviously have better quality and better control using a DSLR. So if you have, and I have like a basic course, it's called, how do I use this fancy camera? And if you want to start dabbling in DSLR, that's a great place to start. iPhone has can do a lot, but it also has limitations. Mm-hmm. So when the lighting is perfect, iPhone is great for that. iPhone can't handle the shadows and the highlights as well. Sometimes it just doesn't pick up details like that. I love using portrait mode on iPhone. That one gets you like the nice background blur. Like, especially if you're doing lifestyle photos, that's a great way to do it. But to get the blur, you have to be like, I think five to eight feet or something away from the pro. Or, you know, there's like a window of what you can be. So if you want to get even closer, for example, for macro, like if you Mm want to get like a really close detail of a petal, you can't do that with iPhone. So iPhone is good for flat lays because you're basically just kind of getting a flat shot of things Mm -hmm. anyway. Mm -hmm. Um, iPhone is good for a wider shot. So if you are having your eye, your flowers in like a bigger scene, then it's mm-hmm. good for that. But if you want it to get really close to your product, your iPhone's not going to be able to do that. So that's where you should get a DSLR. And I would recommend a macro lens for the flower work that you guys are doing, because that one, you'll be able to get like the really kind of ethereal photos where like only one petals in focus, like the edge yeah. of a petal yeah. in focus mm-hmm. and the rest just kind of blurs away, right? Yeah, it's yeah. lovely. I know. <laughs> They don't make great product shots per se because most of the flowers <laughs> blurry. <Yes. laughs> but they do make great lifestyle shots. They do make great art mm-hmm. photos, you know, and especially for your Instagram feed, they're beautiful. They're yeah. dreamy to look at, right? Mm-hmm. So you'll need you'll need a balance of both. You'll need a balance where you're showing the details of everything, where everything is in focus, and then like some of the more artsy, dreamy kind of stuff too. Yeah. I love that. So once you get your fancy camera or you stick with the iPhone, how about editing? 
on the iPhone and also on the fancy camera. Yeah. So if you're doing light editing, so just color correcting, the iPhone is great. I use Lightroom for mobile, Adobe Lightroom for mobile. I also have presets that are pre-made and I'm actually... I don't know when this is launching, but like there's going to be a new preset coming out that's going to be like really good for for flowers. But right Mm -hmm. now, if you have my presets, Pure is really good for floral, but I'm releasing another like add on to it that's really good for that's intentionally meant for like floral products. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, so exciting. (laughs) It gives like a little bit more pop in the color. Yeah. In the colors. Mm -hmm. So, but I would say like, if you have a preset, those will make your editing more consistent. That Mm -hmm. way your Instagram feed all looks like it came from one account. Yeah. Actually, can you explain what presets are for those of the listeners who aren't sure what that is? Yeah. I mean, that's a great question. So presets are basically formulas for editing. So you know how when you open up a photo, you'll want to like adjust the brightness, adjust the exposure, adjust the saturation, right? You want the shadows a certain way. Now, instead of doing that for every single photo one by one, presets are like pre-written out recipes for you. And it's a click of a button. You know, I went into a lot of like research and development to get the perfect formula for the look that I like. So if you like my look, these presets are available to you now. So if you just click one time, it gets the photo like most of the way there. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, you know, some photos have a little bit too much shadows that you'll have to manually fix, or some photos might have too much bright hot spots that you might have to manually fix. But for the most part, it gets you there. And if you already have it perfectly lit, then it should be just a matter of one. Wow. So essentially everyone can have, uh, can style their photos or make their photos look like yours. Yes. Yep. Yes. Awesome. I yeah. love your look because it's so light and airy. Yeah, it is it's gorgeous. Yeah, yeah, but it still has color. Like, you know, yeah. yes. still, that's the most important thing. thing. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I think the really interesting part is like when we look at your floral photography, and we do have quite a bit because we've done a lot <laughs> of you on that, but it's just so perfect. You are so thoughtful about your color correction to make sure that the floral do come in at the right tone. Because sometimes you have to admit, we do paper flowers. We try to mimic real flowers. And sometimes we see the filters that has too much tungsten or has too much, just that. I know it's very popular because skin tones really love greens and browns. And that does not work well with floral whatsoever. And like you said, I mean, like if we're selling a product, we need an accurate representation of what our paper flowers look like, (laughs) even if they are styled, right? Yeah. Because otherwise they come to their front door and they're like, wait, that wasn't what I ordered. That's not the shade or the tone or the hue mm-hmm. that I liked. But somehow, yeah, you're you're able to capture it really well in your photography. So That's we love your work. really important to me. And I think that just comes from me working with commercial clients. Like I actually learned this the hard way. Like the very, I, I had just started and it was for a stationary designer. She was like, hey, can I send you a bunch of stationery and you photograph it for me? So I was like, cool. Yeah. You know, this was like my first chance at like, doing flat lays and product shots. And again, this was like, oh, probably 13 years ago or something like that. <laughs> and this was my first commercial client as well. And I photographed it, sent it back to her. And she's like, oh, wow, I love it. But the colors are not right. She's like this. And she what she does is she sells pre-designed stationery. So they're not custom made, mm-hmm. you know, like you buy a specific suite and she's like yeah "Yeah, like this is actually like this shade of lavender not that shade of lavender right (laughs) yeah I was like oh my god why is she being so picky (laughs) (laughs) and then I realized like you know I thought about I'm like yeah actually that's really important like if a client ordered this thinking that it was a certain color and then they got it and it was a different shade that's gonna really devastate them (laughs) now that's like a wedding (laughs) yeah that said, it's not going to be totally accurate because everyone's screen looks a little yes, bit. Yeah, and depending yeah. on the light that they looked at their screen. So mm-hmm. if they looked at it at nighttime with their y- yellow lights around the house on, right, their lamps on, versus if they looked at it while sitting on the beach, mm-hmm. or if they looked at it in their car, the light is going to render a little bit different. So you could put a disclaimer as well that, mm-hmm. you know, these are handmade slight variations are natural or something like that to cover Mm -hmm. your butt. 
But, <laughs> but of course you want it as accurate as possible. Can, can we go into the apps for, I guess, your fancy camera? Do you also use Lightroom for that too? I do. Yeah. So, oh yeah. So we're talking about mobile versus desktop. Mobile does most of the things. Like I edit so many things on my phone. It handles all of your color correction, your shadows, highlights. It'll even clone out things. Like if you have like messy backgrounds that you don't like, you can mm-hmm. leave. But it's pretty minor. You know, if you want anything more robust, then you should do it on the desk. However, if you're not, if you're a beginner, then you probably aren't going to know how to use the desktop tools anyway. So if that's the case, then the free mobile app actually does a lot of the stuff already. But I think some of the more advanced tools you have to have a, subscription. Yeah. but it's, I think it's worth it. I mean, depending on how much you use it for, I think it's $9.99 a month or something like that, but you get access to a lot of the professional tools on your phone. Yeah. And it's so nice just having that editing function when you are not in the right ideal situation. It does help a lot. (laughs) (laughs) Absolutely. So let's talk about your education program. How to use your fancy camera. What do they actually get in that course? Yeah. So that course, I show you what all the different buttons and dials mean, what they do. I show you how to control your camera. I I notice that there's a lot of people who have fancy cameras and don't actually know how to use them. Mm -hmm. They'll use it either in auto mode or just whatever, you know, they'll just click. <laughs> and so what and that's happens- not wrong. I would say that if you're a beginner, mm-hmm. shoot it in auto mode. But the thing is, look at the settings after you're done. See how your camera readjusts and moves all those buttons. Understand what they mean. It will make you a better photographer. Yeah. The only thing with using auto mode is that the camera doesn't know what you're actually trying to achieve. So for example, if I re- if it I could be taking the same picture of a flower same exact lighting position, everything, but maybe this, maybe I actually wanted everything in focus, or maybe I only wanted the tip of a petal in focus and everything to burn out. Mm -hmm. Your your camera's not going to know the difference of which one you wanted. Right. So it always wants to go on flash too. Yes. It's like, <laughs> oh no. <laughs> and especially if you are trying to get the more like light and airy. Yes. And it's yeah. with a lot of white backdrops or white yeah. light mm-hmm. in the back it's going to try to overcompensate for that and either pop the flash on um, or it's going to give you a silhouette. Yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah that's we laugh I- because we know exactly what you mean. <laughs> <laughs> We've all been there. Yes. Yeah, right? Like how beautiful to shoot a flower on a desk in front of a window, right? With <laughs> yeah. beautiful light coming through and then you grab the I have to say, and- you do an amazing job with that. Okay, yeah. you speaking about that, is that you... I. Don't know if you have a tendency or is that your style or your preference to have lighting in the background Mm -hmm. to light the person who's in front of you. And in my mind, when you're taking that photo, I'm like, where is the other light source where that person is not a silhouette and and likely don't use flash? So how do you compensate for that? You have to use manual mode to be Mm -hmm. able to get that. So if you use your, I know you've all experienced this where, you know, that, that shot where you're the person or the flower is right in front of a window mm-hmm. and it just glows. Yes. yes. Like the window yes. just is You're like, like, I wish yeah. I could capture that. <laughs> yeah. And then you put your phone to it and then all of a sudden. Yeah. Oh. And, and even if you get a fancy camera and you have it on auto mode, it's going to just get a silhouette as well. So you have to shoot in manual mode. So I, sh- I do show you that in the course as well. There's three settings that you have to adjust. So once you take it off auto mode, the three settings to be able to set your exposure and exposure means how much light you're letting in. So Mm -hmm. instead of letting the camera guess how much light to let in, you tell it how much light to let in. There's shutter speed, which is how quickly the the camera opens and shuts, the Mm -hmm. lens opens and shuts. If it's too slow, it's going to be blurry. If it's too fast, then you might not let enough light in. Mm -hmm. There's aperture. Aperture is the important one if you want to do that dreamy kind of look. Aperture will make the difference between whether you have like a tack sharp flower where every single granular thing is in focus versus a dreamy photo of a flower where mm-hmm. maybe just the petal tips are in focus and everything else just kind of blurs away in the background, right? Mm-hmm. So that's determined by aperture. And the last one is ISO. ISO is how much light or how sensitive you want your camera to be, the light, mm-hmm. how light sensitive you want that picture to be. Mm-hmm. Um, so I know it sounds kind of vague right now, but in the course I do, I go into further details of what each is how they come together to create that perfect exposure, that 
perfectly lit photo. But oh. yeah, if you like that dreamy, airy look, uh-huh. uh, you can only get it with your fancy camera in <laughs> <laughs> or would you be able to get it with your preset? Kind of. It depends on how much you've messed up, I guess. <laughs> For lack of better terms. Like if it's a true silhouette, you probably won't be able to because it didn't get any data in the mm-hmm. black. If you took a true silhouette of a photo, the subject is so black that there's no data there. So even if you pull it into photo into Lightroom and you start pulling it up, it's too much to try to recover. Like mm-hmm. Photoshop is great for recovering things, but there's a certain range. There's a latitude of what mm-hmm. it can handle. For example, if you took a picture of someone outside and it totally went white instead, mm-hmm. you know, where it was so bright and it went white and you're trying to pull it back. Mm-hmm. There's only so far you can go. And same thing, if it tur- if you did a silhouette and you're trying to pull up the shadows, you can only go so far. It's probably going to look kind of grainy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And the color is like not enough detail. So you do want to make sure you are within reasonable range to be mm-hmm. able to, to make it look good. Thank you for all these amazing tips. Yeah. I think yeah, it sounds like a good refresher too. <laughs> you know? like, oh yeah. Remember that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it sounds like your online courses are really informative and helpful for not just, not just for beginners, to be honest, because like Quinn said, like it's a really good refresher for us to actually understand mm-hmm. what our camera does. Like mm-hmm. we, we have experience with our camera. We play around with it, but to actually truly understand how they, you know, the three aspects interact with each other Mm -hmm. um, and to get what you want to tell the camera, this is what I want. Like that takes skill, you know, and experience. Um, So right now, especially during quarantine, I have a lot of commercial clients. Like I shoot for a lot of florists, especially people who do mail orders. And during quarantine, you know, they were, some of them were asking me to come shoot for them. Mm-hmm. But it's hard, you know, like just being on lockdown and not lockdown, back on lockdown. And, mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> and so what I started to do was I started to consult with them to teach them how to do it themselves. Now, it doesn't, some of the photographers would be like, oh my God, aren't you giving your job away? It's like, no, because it's still my eye for the creativity stuff, right? Mm-hmm. But what I'm teaching them is how to at least set up for all their e-commerce stuff, mm-hmm. how to shoot for their website, how to shoot basic things for their Instagram. And then if when they're ready to do like a lookbook or Mm -hmm. a a new collection, then they bring me in to do like the more artistic kind of stuff. But with the combination of my fancy camera course and my all about light flash, all about flash course, they were able to then set up their own studio and they've been making their own their own e-commerce. Like they've been able to update their website, keep their Instagram going, you know, without having to Mm -hmm. bring me in and bringing their staff in. Yeah. You know, yeah. Hard, right. Yeah. So yeah, that especially would be right now because everything is online and to yep. be able to rely on your own strength and take your own photography without relying on someone else because you don't know if you can be in the same room right. or the turnaround or just things could happen. Yeah. And it gets expensive bringing me in that frequently, you know, so at least this way they can bring me in like some bring me in monthly, some bring me in quarterly. Mm -hmm. But for their day to day stuff, they are now able to do it themselves. I taught them how to set up a photography, quote unquote, studio, like in a little corner of their space and that they leave it permanently set up. Mm -hmm. You know, they took my course so that they have like the basic understanding of what I'm talking about and what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Then we did like a little conferencing where I showed them set this here, set this here. This is a setting you want. Now they don't even have to touch it. The camera's on a tripod that's on the exact setting they need. The light flash is yeah, on exactly so what it is. Yeah. 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 So anytime they have, if they've done a new arrangement and they need to get a quick photo of it, they can just pop it into this little quote unquote studio of theirs, yeah. get a quick photo and like instant, like they get, and they have it instantly. Right. And yeah. it's better than that. That's wonderful. I've actually heard that from other photographers too, or photographers, uh, florists too, that they just have a designated area to shoot because like you said, all the settings are the same. All the look is the same too. Like if you're styling it a certain way for a brand, it's exactly the same. And it makes it so easy to just be like, you know what, I'm going to take a photo as opposed to like starting it all from scratch, like pulling oh. things out, changing the the lighting and it's like uh oh, then you're gonna need to call caroline all over again <laughs> <laughs> not only that but like you know if you if you're doing commissions for customers you want to be able to shoot it before you ship it out exactly. yeah because yeah. otherwise if when you hire a photographer to come in and people do do this you know where i'll shoot a collection from them but that means that they have to make their entire collection 
Wow. And I work with mostly fresh floors and, you know, that's perishable. Yeah. So <laughs> have to make it like right before I come in. And now they're doing yeah. like say 12 bouquets right before I come in. Yeah. Right. Wow. Um, so it's just a lot more work versus, but they do need it because if there's no pictures of it, how are you going to sell it? Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it is necessary at the same time, like to get those beautiful lifestyle shots. But at least we only have to do that seasonally when they're releasing right. you new collections. And then as they're doing like one-off kind of stuff or custom work, Mm -hmm. then they can photograph it before sending it out and without having me come in every single time or without having to produce all of it in one sitting. Yeah. Yeah. Especially when you have a studio like that, you just pop it in, take a picture and then out it goes out the door. You don't have to think about it and reset everything up. That is genius. So yeah, that would be, I think my biggest takeaway is find that studio space in your, it doesn't even have to be fancy like in any space of yours you know like if you just have a white corner you Mm -hmm. can make this work and like jesse says it can even be done in the middle of the night (laughs) (laughs) well thank you so much caroline this is so fun to have you on and it's great to see you thank you so much caroline for dropping by and sharing with us all of the fantastic tip that that you've given us i mean you have so much experience um, photographing not just weddings but like you said product that's what you were specializing in the past and it's given us a lot to think about in terms of how to improve our own product shots and yeah i mean we look forward to having you come again and tell us more and share with us more of your expertise. Yeah. Yes. Thanks for having me. Always a pleasure talking to you guys and always happy to impart all of, you know, m- learn from my mistakes. So save you some time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs>